Good afternoon, everybody. Can we all hear me? My name is Hussein Mahadi, and I'll be our moderator for today's um, week two of the Gypsy Mentorship and Internship Program for Artificial Intelligence and Technology. So our topic for today is utilizing artificial intelligence and technology in solving challenges. So um, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Anna Hernandez. Good afternoon, Abad Kore, our mentor for today. Good afternoon, Kashifa Idris. Good afternoon, Juliana, Oladotun, Joel. I hope you're all having an amazing day. Okay, thank you very much. So quickly, I'll be making the announcements for today. Firstly, we'll be telling us what Gypsy is all about. Gypsy Mentorship and Internship Program is a quarterly program for students and young professionals across Africa. Mentees are afforded the opportunities to assess valuable advice, training network, mentorship, internship, discussion forums, industry updates, and resource materials from experienced mentors. The program seeks to encourage continuous training, development, and evolution in Africa around the world. You can watch our Gypsy videos on YouTube and Facebook, hashtag GypsyMIP. So the objectives of the programs are to provide easy access to quality professional guidance, training, and resource materials for students and young professionals in Africa and around the world to facilitate dialogue and network among experienced and less experienced practitioners and stakeholders to transform mentees into mentors and leaders for the next generation. And finally, to facilitate further mentorship, internships, scholarship, and job placements for the mentees. So that's what um, GPC Mentorship and Internship Program is all about. So the first announcement for today is that um, the registration for the first quarter of 2022 GPC Mentorship and Internship Program is currently ongoing. You can share the link with your friends and your colleagues that are interested in any of the areas of the courses we have, which are intellectual property, artificial intelligence and technology, the energy industry, fintech, health tech and law and patent drafting. So this next announcement for today is that um, we'll be also having a private mentorship session with your favorite mentors for in Gypsy program. So if you are interested in having a private one-on-one -on -one session, with any of the mentors, you can register through the link bit.ly slash gypsypm. And finally, the last announcement for today is that we'll be having a get together party, which we'll be meeting physically in Abuja and in Lagos. It's the date for the gypsy get together party is December 10th, 2022. So if you are, you are all invited, to come and join us and have fun, play games, drinks and food and vibes. Thank you very much. So quickly, um, I'll be reading out our mentors profiles for today. Our first mentor is Anna Hernandez Guardiet. So Anna Hernandez Guardiet is an artificial intelligence technologist and product design engineer, paving her career paths in innovative technology with a focus on positive social and environmental impact. So that's the profile for Anna Hernandez. Thank you for everything that you do and thank you for choosing to be our mentor for today. So our second mentor for today is Mr. Albert Kure. I'll be reading his profile shortly. So Mr. Albert Kure is a special assistant to the governor of Kaduna State. So um, we can call him Your Excellency Albert Kure for today. Um, innovations and technology where he works to strengthen system and structure that supports the development and implementation of viable policies and programs. He promotes, regulates, and oversees the development and expansion of businesses, supports innovation, and accelerates tech adoption while building vibrant entrepreneurial and digital ecosystem in collaboration with private stakeholders, development partners, and other public sector actors. At Thought for Food, where he serves as 
regional coordinator for West Africa. He works to shape the future of agriculture and build inclusive resilience and sustainable food system through advocacy, innovation, collaboration, and most importantly, action. Wow, thank you very much for all that you do, Mr. Albert Ture. So as co-founder of Frontier SS, a science solution company in Nigeria, Abat is a United Nations Internet Governance Forum, Youth X policymaker, one young world ambassador and alumni of prestigious programs like the Jinko Blue Works funded 2021, Bio Africa Fellowship 2019, African Presidential Leadership Program, APLP, and Kashim Ibrahim Fellowship 2020 to 2021. Thank you very much for joining us today and choosing to mentor the next generation, Mr. Abbas Hure. So quickly, we'll be jumping to our PowerPoint presentations. I'll call on the first group, which is group one. The presenter for group one, you can start your presentation and also share your screen with us. Thank you very much. You have eight minutes to present. So kindly take note of time. Thank you. Group one, the presenter for group one, are you with us, please? Kindly unmute yourself and start your presentation. I think the presenter for group one is Esther Y. Ajayi, and the backup presenter is Adewale Ola Dimeji. So if the presenter is not available, the um, backup presenter can start the presentation. Hello. Yes, we can hear you, Esther. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? So I'm yes. having a serious network issue at my end. I can't even hear you speaking. Wow. Okay, so um, I think we can hear you now, so you can start your presentation. You can hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I think we can't hear her again. So the backup presenter for group one or any of the group member should step in and make the presentation for group one. Or um, group two can start your presentation when I group one is trying to figure out who will make the presentation. Two, you can start your presentation if you are available. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now, Esther. Okay, you can hear me now. Yes. Um, sorry, I'm having a um, network issue at my hand, so I don't know if um, my co-presenter can help me with the slide. I can't connect with my system, so it's actually giving me a tough time here. So I'm using okay. my phone. Okay, I think I'll, I'll be able to help you do that so you can... With the slide? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. I think, can you see my slides on the screen? Yes, yes, I can see your slide. Thank you very much. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for this platform and the opportunity to um, present on behalf of my group, which is group one. My name is Ajay Esther. So this um, afternoon, we are discussing utilizing artificial intelligence to serve um, social economic challenges, utilizing artificial intelligence to solve. Uh, the case study for this study is um, our case study is government, public services, agricultural, health, banking, and educational sector. And um, we are going to consider last week um, we defined artificial intelligence. And uh, in the course of the training, we made known that 
artificial intelligence refers to the utilization of computer technology to enable merchants to think and act like human. That is using artificial intelligence to aid human function, to aid um, um, the productivity of human being and um, to assist human being. So now, what are the social economic challenges? Please let me move the slide to the next page here, social economic challenges. So now talking about the social economic challenges, social economic challenges refers to the interaction of social and economic factors within the society. Now it's a combination of social and economic factors within our society. And um, this arises in the absence of meaningful development. That is social economic challenges arises when there is no development, there is no institutional development, no good road, there is poor heads, there is no economic development, unemployment, corruption, hardship in the society. This is when we experience socioeconomic challenges. And um, going forward, now, we now discuss the interrelationship between artificial intelligence and socioeconomic challenges. Now, talking about the artificial intelligence and the socioeconomic challenges, we have the introduction of artificial intelligence, which has brought about drastic improvements, drastic improvements in the mode of processing activities across various sectors and achieving what's right to result. That is, with the use of artificial intelligence in our socioeconomic challenges, socioeconomic challenges which include um, add, um, unemployment, which include bad roads, which include um, health challenges, which include economic um, breakdown and stuff like that. We have um, AI to improve and they enhance them, at least to give us an achieving and not worthy result with respect to our social economic challenges. Now, with the utilization of artificial intelligence in varieties of sectors to aid and foster development, social economic challenges can be tackled and resolved from more effectively, meaning that when we input or we engage in artificial intelligence in various sectors, which includes our educational sectors, government sectors, health sectors, and um, economic education sector, it actually um, tackles the problem, the challenges, the economic challenges, and it resolves and give us more effective solution, effective solutions and resolutions to the problem. Then going forward now, we now have examples of various areas in which artificial intelligence can actually um, aid different sectors, our socioeconomic sectors, which include the agricultural sector, the banking sector, the health sector, um, the education sector. So now talking about the um, use of artificial intelligence in agricultural sector, use of artificial intelligence in the, um, okay, government sector first, before going to ag um, agricultural sector. When we're talking about the use of artificial intelligence in government sector, we are talking about how we can assist members of the public to interact with government and access with government. We're talking about how um, artificial intelligence can be used to improve productivity in the government sectors and public services. We said due to the increasing complexity and the diversities in people needs, government must understand, test, and incorporate new methods into the public services. Now, for public services, we notice that in public services, we find it very, very difficult to assess government. There is no opportunity for citizens to assess government, to interact with government on a good level. So we, we now said, Part of the influence that AI can have on government public sector is to introduce, use visual assistance or chat boots that direct people to their corporate areas without government finding out, I mean, without government filling out forms. That is, we can use various um, online platforms, maybe this website built from, for each state or government sectors to solve problems. We can, we can easily um, assess the government. Then also, we also have um, um, retirees in the government sector that want, actually wants to assess, they have one problem or the other to solve, they want to assess, they have questions to ask. With the use of AI, site, chat boots, they can easily solve this problem. And as we said in many countries, AI is already being used. 
and it's been designed to, to, new, to design new strategies of public services administration that can benefit both the leaders and masses. And um, considering the use of um, AI, AI can actually in um, government and the public services can be used to build capacity, can be used for capacity building. And capacity building is actually a national priority for the members of the international government. And it can be used in contributing to remedial um, changes in part in diverse strata of administration. Also, um, if we want to consider the benefits, what are the benefits of AI? One of the important benefits of AI is that it improves criminal database management and system. It also fastens immigration application processes and it's improved cybersecurity. That is, you want to apply for immigration um, passport or stuff like that with the use of AI, you can easily um, just go there, source the problem. I mean, without going there, you can be at the corner of your house, log into the site, fasting your application, you want to renew, you can use it. Then also, then also you can easily um, improve your criminal database management system. So example is the Australia government, example of hey, high in government and business service is the Australia government, which um, recently they work on a centralized digital identification authentication, which, which was done after a break a break into their personal data of almost 101 million citizens. That is recently Australia, they actually they work on a centralized digital identification authentication. That is um, ID cards, having your information, your data for their um, workers, for their citizens. And then this was done after there is a break in their data. There is a break into their data, which the um, personal data of over 10 million of their citizens. And then it's important to note that in the issue of technology, technology is actually very crucial to enable citizens' centricity and the, which is the potential, um, which, is the, uh, which is the potential to create more timely, joint, whole, personified, and cost-effective public services. Then also, Effective digital, um, digital can actually begin with empowering and motivating workforce. That is, if government actually needs, um, if um, want to achieve a high in government and public services, it actually starts with effective digital state, states, which begins with empowering and motivating workforce. That is, a high is not to replace human being. So human being, which is the workforce, which is people that are doing the work, they need to be empowered. And on the other hand, they also need to be motivated. AI is just to assist. It's just to enable easy access, it's to enable easy um, work-life balances, to enable easy government and public services. That is everything they are going to be carried out easily. Then also, we also have a feature assistance and then chat boot which is being used by government in uh, um, Australia taxation office. That is the feature that assists the, that assists the office, to, um, that are, the um, feature assistance that is tag Alex. And the Alex is actually um, launched in February, 2010. And as of June, 2017, research shows that Alex could respond to more than 500 questions and it has engaged in 1.5 conversation and solve over 81 percent of questions and inquiries that um, was was asked or was contacted via um, their online um, assistance, and that's for Australia. Australia is actually one of the examples of the country that is doing well in terms of pay high in government and public sectors. So now let's move to agricultural sector. Now, agricultural sector. AI is actually useful in uh, agricultural practices. And then um, AI can influence different um, areas of the agricultural sector, which includes the irrigation, the wedding, the spraying, which is made possible with the help of drones and robots. And then these technologies actually save the excessive use of water, pesticide, um, abscite, and maintain fertilizers on the soil. And then also, it's important to note that um, in agricultural industry, artificial intelligence is actually 
we actually help them to build or to get high productivity. And then it actually helps to control their pets, it helps them to monitor their soils, it helps to maintain and monitor the growing of their, um, uh, of their products, agricultural products. And now it's important to consider the life cycle of agriculture. The life cycle of agriculture actually starts from preparation of soil. That's the tilling of ground. You want to plant your, your crops, you till the ground, you sow the seed. After tilling the ground, after um, breaking the teeth and everything, you prepare the ground, then you, you sow the seed. Then after sowing, sowing the seed, you had fertilizer because fertilizer will actually aid um, in improving the, the output of the product, which is the production that you're going to get at the end of the day. And adding fertilizers actually helps the plant's nutrients because the fertilizer will add the nitrogen, the sulfurs, and the phosphorus um, to, 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 to the plant. And after that, we talk about irrigation and then weed protection. Then after weed protection, then your crop is um, ripe for harvest, you harvest. Then after harvesting, we talk about the storage. Then for countries like India and the agricultural sectors, they've accounted for 18% of the country's GDP and it provides employment to 50% of the country's workforce. And the development in the agricultural industry will actually boost rural development and then ultimately result in a structural transformation within the agricultural sector. Then it's important to consider that um, the example of AI in the agricultural sector, the example of AI in the agricultural sector is the German-based tech startup, which is named PES, which developed a high application, which is called Plantix. And then this Plantix is used to identify nutrient deficiency in soils. And then it also helps to discover if there is any pests, there is any diseases by which, and it also helps farmers to get ideas to use their fertilizers. And it's also an, improve their harvest quality. That is with the use of these plastics and plantics, you can actually, you can snap with the hair, check your soil, see if the soil is healthy, the ground is healthy, the soil is healthy for planting, for plantation. Then after that, you can check your plants, if there's any disease on the plant, your crops, you can check if there's any disease. And then the hair, Sorry to interrupt, Esther Jai. Um, I think your time is up, so you can just quickly okay. summarize. Okay, okay, let me summarize then. Okay, now use of AI in the um, banking industry. So um, AI has actually influenced a lot of things in the banking industry, and it starts from customer services, um, giving out um, a good customer services, cyber security, general productivity, credit direct, and then robots. And then AI in banking industry is used to predict future outcomes and trends. And then it's used to identify fraud, detect money laundries, and then also make customers recommendation. That's the use of AI, um, the use of AI in banking industry. Then it also helps customer support services. That is, it can, um, AI in banking industry is and we have an example of UBLU. And in that UBLU, you can be at home and chat. You can actually contact your service provider. You can chat with the chat group, most common, and then to make inquiry, to access um, um, your computer, I mean, your bank, without you even having to go into the banking, um, to, the, um, to the bank, to the bank itself. That is, you can do everything online. Then also, it can be used to produce help, um, produce help and determine credit worthy um, cred credit worthiness. Then let me watch it down. Let me talk about X sector. The X sector, you can use AI to diagnose a lot of things, diagnose diseases, treat um, the patient, then to monitor the care and the drugs of the patient. Then also let's talk about the education system. In the education system, the AI can be used. The AI can be used um, to enhance teaching and learning. That is to say, that is um, AI can be used to learn a lot of things. At least there are a lot of things we learn one on one online. 
that without the help of physical classroom, you can actually contact or connect with your teacher, your lecturer to learn. Then AI can also be used to detect plagiarism in education. In the education sector, you can use AI to detect plagiarism. You can use AI to increase learning. And then you can use um, artificial intelligence to solve um, educational problems and to connect your lecturers, campuses, and stuff like that. Then also, we now talk about the recommendation and suggestion. We said proper funding of research into AI to get the most out of the increased utilization. I know my time is off, but please, um, let me conclude by saying the use of AI um, through, the, through proper awareness and sensitization of general public as to the use of incorporation of artificial intelligence into the various system of human living can lay emphasis on the benefits of the incorporation. That is, um, with the use of AI, we can actually, with the use of AI, we can actually solve our socioeconomic problems, which we've stated, which includes the home employment, the banking issues, um, the, the unemployment, the economic breakdown, and some other things, the ex problems, issues, and et cetera. Thank you very much. I'm true. Thank, Thank you very much, Esther Ajayi, for that wonderful presentation. I believe we all um, listened attentively and learned something from that. Um, I'll be calling on Group 2 to present. Can you know that you have eight minutes to summarize your presentation? Thank you, Group 2. You can, the presenter for Group 2 can unmute yourself and share your screen with us. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to the organizers and our mentors for today. My name is Oyemiola Dotson, and I'll be representing Group 2. OK, give me a minute, and I would um, share my slides. Okay. Okay, I can see that the screen sharing is loading. Um, I don't know why it's taking so long. In order to save time, I think I will just start. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see your screen. All right, thank you very much. So today we'll be discussing utilizing artificial intelligence in solving security challenges. So um, last week we were able to look at the um, definition of artificial intelligence and majorly an introduction to what artificial intelligence is and what it is not. We made a distinction between artificial intelligence and robotics. We were able to identify a definition that was acceptable by one of our mentors last week. And that was the definition that was put forth by group one. So in identifying how artificial intelligence can be used to solve security challenges, first of all, I will start with an introduction to say that um, security is a vital part of our everyday life. It, um, it forms how we feel safe in our homes, how we feel safe in our interactions with people, how we transact our businesses, how we ensure that our um, trademarks, our copyrights, and what have you is safeguarded, our privacy rights, our data protection is enforced. Security touches on every aspect of our everyday life. From, um, looking at it from business transactions to family and home life, to education, to banking, and even for the areas highlighted by group one. So how can we um, utilize artificial intelligence in ensuring that security is better, um, security is enhanced in today's society? Um, first, I would like to state that because of the advent of technology, technological innovations, there has been security before. Um, maybe say 
few years back or um, maybe in the 1900s, you could focus more on just physical security. But now we have to talk about digital security because of the advent of technology. So um, let's look at a brief definition of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a type of intelligence displayed by machines when you have like machine um, learning to help enhance our everyday life, when you have um, interactions with algorithms and devices to ensure that things that we naturally do ourselves are done by machines, they are done easier, they are done faster, and they are done in a more effective way. There is an opposition to natural intelligence faced by human beings and artificial intelligence refers to these technologies that can understand, learn, and act based on information that has been acquired and derived for humans. When we have um, uploaded a particular set of information or when we have built a device to learn to interact with man or to interact as a man or to help assist human activities, we can now say, okay, artificial intelligence is coming into play. So now, what is the role of artificial intelligence to security? How can you apply artificial intelligence in, into cybersecurity? Or what is first of all cybersecurity? Let's look at it as pronounced. Cybersecurity is ensuring that everything you do on the web, everything you do online is secured. Your information, your personal data, your credit card information, basically everything you've uploaded on the internet as an online entity, your information is secured. So what then is the role of artificial intelligence in helping or in um, enhancing cybersecurity? First, it helps to re reduce risk of breach or, or um, cyber threats. It also helps to improve the overall security posture or the overall security um, firewall that has been built for whatever device. So at this point, I would like to talk about spoofing. Spoofing is a situation whereby a person imitates another person in order to get information from the victim. For example, you get an email asking you to maybe update your financial information or asking you to probably change your password or what you, and it looks completely harmless. It looks like something you get from your bank or something you get from a legitimate organization. And unknown to the individual, you follow the link or you just choose to follow the instructions given and then you update your information. And before you know it, your, um, your maybe like your email is hacked into or your account is hacked into and whatnot. So spoofing is when someone or an entity imitates another to act as, to gain confidence or to gain trust from the victim or to gain trust from the targeted individual. So it's an example of cyber threats when um, your information is, is being asked for and you unknowingly follow the instructions and then you give out the information. Or I'm just trying to say that it's um, one of the ways in which cybersecurity needs to be enhanced and artificial intelligence come to play. When a machine has learned the patterns or the way that this, this cyber threats come to play, like um, this is how they usually do it, or this is the way, like the, the kind of threats or the kind of patterns that these hackers follow, you can, the machine can give you a signal to let you know that, oh, okay, this site is not a trusted site or this interesting issue you still want to follow. So like, we get this in our everyday life. These are like just simple examples we can relate to. So how does artificial intelligence work in security? As I said, artificial intelligence learns from past data and identify patterns and trends. So it makes the information that is used previously make predictions for how such future I might follow. So this helps you to be more aware because it's as though like your, your internet service provider or your system is looking for you, is looking out for threats that, that has maybe happened for, but are coming in different forms. So like these are like intricacies of inter, um, artificial intelligence and cybersecurity. So next, we're going to look at the benefits of integrating artificial intelligence with cybersecurity. So artificial intelligence learns more, learns faster than humans. 
they are able to identify unknown threats based on the patterns used previously or maybe let me use a, a very simple example when you get an email from an unknown source the link tends to look like they look alike to something you get from your bank for example maybe um you get an email from your bank asking you to like take certain actions of course banks have declared that they don't actually do that anymore or they don't do that at all but just using to cite an example the if it's a if it's a threat to your information if it's from an ACA or if it's um a spoofing attack it will look exactly or it will look very similar to what you get from your bank or from your legitimate source so and you identify that it is not a legitimate link or it's not something you should follow so like these are like things that cyber security is able to um, artificial intelligence is able to read into based on information that has been learned over time, based on deep machine learning, based on algorithms that it has been able to read that, okay, this is the manner in which a bank sends information. So this is a strange link. This is a strange um, pattern. This is something that is not in line with the regulations that have already been put in place. So it helps you to better manage how vulnerable you are as, a, as an online entity. And then um, artificial intelligence also has the ability to undo a lot of data, has the ability to um, process volumes of data at a, part, at a particular time, much more than a human can ever get to be. Even though some sci-fi movies say that, okay, we have like 100% um, um, ability to use our brain, blah, blah, blah. And we've only like tapped into maybe 1%. But like for a machine, a machine is able to do this more effectively than a man has been able to then overall better overall security generally then moving on we'll look at ai adapters artificial intelligence adapters these are like um organizations or service providers that have been able to adapt artificial intelligence in their act in their delivery of services for example google and you basically have like Google, you have Amazon, you have Facebook. Many of these organizations have used artificial intelligence in some way, either to target advertising, either to analyze information that you most likely be interested in, either to um, identify patterns in your previous um, online interaction, different ways. And then they've been able to look at how to better secure your online presence or your online interaction they've been able to up their what's it called their security um policies or data privacy policies or data protection policies to ensure that um individuals or online individuals online entities are secured in that in their interactions with um other people or in their interactions with other sites so we can see here on the slides that um, Google and other agencies, Microsoft, are developing innovative approaches to detect malware, phishing attacks, and to monitor the spread of information, or to even monitor the spread of um, malware, spoofing, and all related areas. So, a notable success is Microsoft's Cyber Signals program that uses artificial intelligence to analyze. 224 trillion security signals and whatnot. So we've seen like so much progress with um, artificial intelligence in terms of security of our presence online. And then looking at it also a physical aspect, we've actually seen so much security, um, so much advancement of our security physically because now we have smart homes we have um, CCTV cameras, we have dash cams, we have body cams. We have like several ways to ensure that security is up tight, to ensure that you feel safer at home, to ensure that you feel safer when interacting on the internet or when interacting online. So now we'll be looking at challenges of artificial intelligence in cybersecurity. Sorry to interrupt, you... and I think you have 60 seconds more to present. Okay, that's so fine. Please... I would wrap up now. Okay, look, during our interaction as a group, we identify that 
um, as much as we have so much advancement with artificial intelligence in terms of security, it also poses such great threats to us because it's sort of a battle of the first of the, of the fastest runner. Whoever is able to develop faster is able to provide either more security or provide more attack or more threats. So as much as we are advancing technologically and using artificial intelligence in enhancing um, security, over, um, enhancing cybersecurity. There are also people on the other side who are attempting to steal more information, um, corrupt our system with malware and what have you. So, like we can actually look through these slides, so I can run through it. Example of cybersecurity threats have been identified. I already mentioned phishing, spam detection, detecting bots, production, prediction of breach risk and um, automated malware detention, um, detection and prevention. Then it also helps to reduce the number of false um, positives. Then um, furthermore, there are like some interesting things that we came to identify during our search. We saw that 95% of cybersecurity breaches are caused by human error. Sometimes when in uploading um, in, in like machine learning, sometimes there are like mistakes. We identified algorithm bias last week. We also identified that um, some of these bias can also be transferred to the system, can be transferred to the artificial intelligence. And then an estimated 300 billion passwords are used by humans and machines worldwide. These are like interesting facts that we identified. Then in conclusion, I would like to say that artificial intelligence provides as much um, needed security as we as we want, like in terms of the advancements we have been able to see throughout like my discussion. But then we also know that there's the flip side to artificial intelligence in such that it can be used otherwise, it can be used by um, hackers and all. So um, as a matter of conclusion, I would just say that the ab ability of artificial intelligence to analyze a large volume of data in a short period of time is one is a great advantage to us as humans. But how do we regulate the threats that come with this artificial intelligence innovation? I feel like some of these things are things that our mentors might probably address while discussing today. Thank you very much for listening, and this is the end of the presentation. Thank you very much, Olado Tunko Yemi. So um, thank you for the listeners and everybody that um, put up that wonderful presentation for group two. So we'll be calling on our mentors, um, the first mentor, Mr. Albert Skure, to give us some remarks on the both presentation and also mentors on the topic, utilizing AI in solving our daily challenges. Thank you very much. Okay, hello everyone. Can you hear hello, me? Hello, sir. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, um, thank you very much guys for the presentation. Um, it's a pleasure to be here once again. I did mentor with um, some previous cohorts and I'm excited to always have conversations with um, people who are interested in certain sectors of um, the industry around the world, right? Um, I think I would want to start off with um, the approach I would take to the topics, right? Um, the, the, Presenters did very adequate research and backed up their information with as much data as they could get their hands on. I did notice a few gaps for the people who talked about security, but then um, we'll touch on that a bit later. But for now, I think um, I would want to start off with the first presentation around AI for tackling social economic challenges and just mention the fact that for technology, right? We mentioned that technology is an enabler, it's supposed to complement what we do as human beings, right? I think beyond complementation um, and um, enabling, something that is very important from a social dynamic with regards to any form of technology, whether emerging or already existing tech, is the issue of context, right? So I think for context, you would need to begin to consider what is the reality on ground during both the development of your technology as well as um, the utilization or use of that that approach or that technology. And so for instance, the reality on the ground in terms of the problems that we face as a society, maybe let's assume in Nigeria or any other developing country um, may be different from the context that a developed country would um, in reality face. And so it then means that when tackling problems, particularly from a tech perspective, you then need to consider all of the factors 
that are present within that social system, right? So um, I think for me, AI for tackling social economic challenges starts from the what exactly you want to tackle, uh, because that depends on the context and the reality you're faced with. So it's around what you want to solve, what challenge you want to tackle. It's around why you want to tackle that challenge. And then also how you then go about tackling it. Because for instance, when Anna comes up, maybe she may touch on this before, from an engineering perspective, when you begin to want to solve problems using um, programming or any other kind of like emerging technology approach, the how matters. Because at the end of the day, you don't want to begin to use the wrong methodology or um, build a system for the wrong, um, or take a wrong approach in solving a very real problem, right? So I think the what, the why, and the how are very critical with um, regards to solving or tackling socioeconomic challenges. And the reality of it is that in, in, in human societies, there's so much problems already and you can't solve them all, okay? And so that's why most times when building solutions, we usually advise that you start with as little of a problem as possible. In as much as, yes, we live in a systemic world and we're trying to think systemically and things are all interconnected, you need to start as small as possible and then grow later on to make all of those interconnections, right? So that's one thing I wanted to bring into the conversation, the social dynamics and social aspects that um, are involved in the creation or development and also the use of um, artificial intelligence to tackle challenges. Um, beyond just the context also is then the issue around access, right? So it's one thing for a technology to exist, but it's another thing for people to be able to access that technology for use or to be able to successfully incorporate that into their daily lives. So for access, I'll talk about the fact that there's um, obvious technical and digital divides that exist in our world. I have been part of um, um, the UN's approach to try to bridge digital divides in several um, UN-based programs. And we know that the reality of it is that internet penetration rates are very low in certain regions, um, access to technology, access to smartphones, to devices, to um, all of the infrastructure that would enable you to adopt emerging technology differs from society to society. So beyond the context of the problem you face, there's also the angle of the access you are able to obtain, okay? So those are considerations that are very real because now the way that, um, someone who lives in a remote area or in a rural community would be technically allowed by the system that exists in his location to engage with certain platforms or certain solutions will definitely differ from the level of access someone in the urban community that has 5G connectivity or something as amazing as that would have, okay? So context in terms of the kind of problem, the reality on the ground, access in terms of um, obvious digital and technological divides that exist are things and considerations that need to take, um, that we need to take into account when we talk about using actual intelligence to tackle economic challenges. And then the last thing I want to touch on, or one of the last things is the adoption rates. So you can have access to technology or AI powered um, solutions, but then adoption rates could still be low, right? So it's one thing to have access, another thing to use the solution based on the access that you have. And so in regards to that, we then begin to talk about um, the social context of um, building understanding and knowledge of artificial intelligence within communities and so societies. So you would always have pushback, you would always face resistance. Um, for people who are familiar with systems perspectives, you will know that for every um, uh, innovation or every solution you build to tackle a challenge within a system, there's always going to be obvious resistance because there's already an established status quo. There's someone that benefits from the system or the society being the way it is. And so that person or those groups of people become your first pushback because people would normally resist change when that change doesn't benefit them. So I'm just trying to take us through like the social dynamics of um, artificial intelligence with regards to um, tackling socioeconomic challenges because these social dynamics are very important, particularly if you are living in a developing country that is trying to push the boundaries and catch up with some parts of the world that are so far advanced. Um, another consideration then is leveraging that knowledge and understanding to build trust. So how fast people are to adopt your solution would be directly related to how much they trust that solution. So it's one thing for you to build an amazing a platform to have wonderful programs, to have algorithms that are impeccable, 
is another thing for that to translate into trust for people to then use your platform, okay? So in terms of trust, we talked, we usually would mention the issues around sensitization, building public consensus, allowing people engage in testing rounds to understand the implication and the advantages that um, adopting some technology or artificial intelligence based solutions would have. Now, another thing I always used to have to bring to conversations is that when trying to get people to improve access to certain AI powered devices or solutions or to increase adoption rates, you always want to ask people, if not now, when? Because most times the, the, the arguments that people bring up when they want to push back against um, solution adoption that are based on artificial intelligence is always the, we, should, we can't do this now, we shouldn't do this now, let's wait 10 more years, 15 more years, it would affect jobs, it would get people out of employment, there's always some arguments, right? And for me, I then ask the question, okay, if you're not going to do this now, when then will you be able to do it? Or when then will you implement what you're supposed to implement? So understanding knowledge drives trust, and then this trust ensures now that people engage with your solution and adopt all of what you build. Um, something that is very critical also from a social perspective is um, the policy infrastructures, right? Um, so I'm a policymaker, so I'll probably focus a bit more on this uh, because for any solution to exist and thrive, the enabling environment needs to exist for the growth of that solution. So for some of you who are aware of the times when um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and some other people from Google were invited to like um, have conversations with um, uh, policymakers at congressional hearings, at Senate hearings, these are all mechanisms that are in place to ensure that while we develop solutions that are based on um, AI technology and are supposed to help human beings, you want to ensure that the regulatory frameworks exist in place to protect the humans you're creating or building the solutions for. Okay, so it's one thing to have a solution, it's another thing to protect the people who the solution is meant to, um, to support. Um, so I, I think those are just kind of things I wanted to throw out there. Um, the group one touched on a lot of aspects to how to solve um, socioeconomic challenges. I think also it's important to touch on the economic angle and viability of artificial intelligence. I'll just give you an example, right? So for, for home security, for instance, right? A new market research recently showed that um, home security as an industry would be worth $74.75 billion by 2023, okay? And this is up from $45.5 billion in 2018. Now, this just shows the economic viability that exists with regards to security from a home perspective, right? Surveillance systems, uh, protective um, 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 approaches, use of um, CCTV cameras that have some form of... Um, AI incorporated into them to probably screen out who is permitted to access where and who isn't permitted to access what space. So all of these things are things that would allow you to understand the advantages that exist with adopting AI for um, 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 socioeconomic development. Now, I know most of you here have probably like a legal and a public policy or, um, um, or, or public policy approach or perspective with regards to your experience. So all of you may not go on to be programmers or developers. And that's why I talked to just bring in also the fact that there's the policy um, angle to AI in the world right now. Africa as a continent isn't as developed as we would want it to be. So for instance, in May of 2022, um, there was convened a guard room that was meant to ensure that we have conversations around artificial intelligence for Africa. Right, because the African Union was trying to build a continental strategy that was comprehensive, but also taking note of our context in Africa. And so then the, the conversation around that was packed around um, AI in Africa as a policy document. And by December 2022, that will be released um, and you can all have access to that. But I think beyond just the policy being released at an African Union level, there's also the need to contextualize that in the country perspective, right? Because each country then has to go on to break down all of that policy into how it affects them, what is most important or most relevant to them as well. Now, AI is a tool and it's supposed to help us solve real problems. Um, one of the problems I'm very passionate about right now is food insecurity. And 
the obvious reason for that is because it affects all of us. It affects everyone, right? And it has environmental dimensions. It has socioeconomic dimensions. It has health implications. It touches on every aspect of our lives. And just to touch on that, I wanted to mention the fact that there are amazing innovators around the world that are building AI-based solutions to solve everyday agricultural problems. Um, I, I, I am affiliated to an organization called Thoughts for Food. And what we do is we catalyze innovation to solve agricultural challenges. And just to mention a few, um, I've worked with, um, as a mentor, a team in Cameroon that owns a, a, a solution called PFMS. And what that does is it's an AI powered um, mobile software that allows disease detection in poultry. And this was as a result of the um, uh, poultry deaths that happened in their country that really affected the economy as well as the livelihoods of the farmers in Cameroon as a country, right? So AI is supposed to drive how we develop our lives, but at the same time, it shouldn't take center stage in a way that it phases us as humans out. But should in case an approach or a time comes when AI phases us out, I usually always tell people as a joke that there are two people or two categories of people that won't be phased out by AI. Number one is the people that build the AI. So that's Anna and her colleagues as engineers who build the AI soft, uh, platforms and softwares. And then there's the people who create the regulation for AI, right? Which are myself included. So those are the two categories of people who will not be adversely affected if AI eventually takes over the world. This is just me throwing a, a, a mild joke at you guys. So if you would want to then prepare for the future in a way that allows you to, to thrive despite the changes in our world, you need to either be in the group of people building the solutions or in the group of people making regulation that drives the adoption or use of the solutions. So I think those are just a few things from the first cohort. The second cohort, uh, the second group, I just want to mention that you guys focus a lot more on cybersecurity, but there's a lot of fiscal dimensions um, to security as well that um, you guys would have been able to touch on. So I know the allure is that uh, because we're talking about AI, it's more fun and interesting to engage with AI from a security perspective that is computer-based, right? So it's cybersecurity, access to your emails, access to databases and things like that, right? But for people who live in certain realities, cybersecurity is even so far off in terms of an attainment for them. And so it's also important to consider even the practical physical security infrastructural use for artificial intelligence. So for instance, there's a, there's a startup in Israel that is building um, an AI-based um, platform that helps um, security agents to detect bombs or threats by scanning the underside of vehicles, okay? So, okay, so somebody saying in the chat section that lawyers who are regulators are covered, right? Um, so that's really good. I'm happy that you're comfortable at being covered. Um, so, but to bring us back to the conversation of physical use of AI, or rather the use of AI in physical security, there's so many dimensions to it from the robotics perspectives. I know we know that robotics is different from AI, but then most robotic technology right now adopts some form of artificial intelligence for their effective use in our everyday lives, right? And so because of that, then there's robotics, um, robotic surveillance, um, use of um, autonomous drone systems that are able to analyze information, capture data and make decisions as the need requires them to. We have um, 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 the home security, obviously, and then also um, home assistance systems that are AI-based. We have um, border control light detectors right now. So I, I was reading them up recently, and then um, they were trying to work on a way that to take out human biases that exist at borders during immigration. Um, some countries are playing with the idea of using um, light detectors that are AI-based. AI and right, what these platforms would do is that they would gauge facial micro gestures and determine if you are lying or telling the truth. So rather than coming up to um, an immigration officer and the person judging you by the color of your skin or by um, what you wear or by how you look, um, the actual intelligence based platform just does that by measuring the micro gestures that you make when you answer questions that are asked at the immigration um, immigration points. So there are so many dynamics to um, AI as regards um, physical um, security systems and physical security infrastructures that you guys could also take time to look into. Um, 
at this point, I will take a pause and allow Anna to go on and then we'll come back to the questions that you guys had sent um, previously. Thank you very much for listening and sorry that I rant on and on. I talk quite a lot. Thank you very much, Mr. Abaturi. We really enjoyed your um, contributions and um, remarks. And um, we would have loved you to continue, but for the sake of time. So I think someone is raising up his hand. I think someone has a direct question for you. So we'll allow the person to ask the question immediately before Miss uh, Anna jump in. So Ade Wali, Ali, the person raising up your hand. Sorry, let's just hear from Anna first and then we take all the questions together, please. Okay, okay. So, um, Ms. Anna, you can, Miss Anna, sorry. Thank you very much, everyone, for your presentations. They were all um, amazing. I will take the lead back from Albert and start by saying how the importance in AI is clear, and you explained that really well today, how it has such potential to solve so many issues in the world. However, it's also interesting to see, as Albert was mentioning, um, the risks it has and how we need to have these into consideration before uh, we implement this um, rather than fast and quickly and um, doing it slowly and well. So it's a question about how we're going to do this, what methods we're going to use and um, what little problems we want to solve first and start building up from there um, as opposed to trying to tackle a really huge issue all at once because that is unlikely to work in a first instance. So I'm going to start get, talking through the groups first. So in the first group, um, in the one focused about social economic challenges, I'd like to start by saying um, one of the definitions used for AI was to the utilization of computer technology to enable machines to think and act like humans. So here is, I think, as a conception that we tend to have um, as an AI, like a threat or a compo um, contestant against humans, which I think is um, it gives us like fear for AI when in reality it should be our tool and our friend and something we design and define what it is to us. So I think AI should have a huge purpose more so than try to act like us or be like us. Um, it's so much better than us in so many things and it's so much worse than us in so many other things. So they, it's a different league and we're, we're not competing. It's, it's not smarter or it's slower or better or worse. It's just, it's there for what it is, which is to solve big issues. It's currently not used for that. And as you mentioned, big corporations are using it for other things that are not focusing on social good or environmental good, but it has that potential. And for as long as we try to make AI human, um, it won't really fulfill this, um, this role that AI should have in society. So um, here, there's also another thing that was mentioned in the slide that was saying that social economic challenges will only be possible to tackle um, when human bias and errors are erased, which is totally true and is probably one of the main uh, triggers and stoppers for this to happen. But I also think that, that this, if human bias will last for so many, so for so long, it probably won't ever be erased. And that leading to AI, we can try to anticipate this and try to teach AI the same way as you could like teach a kid to be less biased. Uh, but this is also going to take a long time and it's complicated because who, decide, who decides what it is to be not biased? It's really complicated. But I have the hope that AI can solve social economic challenges before it overcomes this bias as long as we are careful when we're designing it. So, for example, AI um, solutions for climate change and something that maybe has less to do with bias. Of course, climate change has a lot to do with um, social issues, but... Um, there are more practical um, solutions that AI could tackle without getting rid of this uh, bias while we work on it. So I think there's a there's a faster approach to AI than, than we think. Um, also, I think there's so many other things that are stopping AI from being effective for bigger challenges than just bias. It's um, the lack of access to digitalization, as Albert said, and the lack of good data. So currently Google and Amazon and all these big corporations collect data already with a vision of applying AI for their goal. So they have a clear um, a clear purpose on why to collect AI and then they apply it very efficiently that way. However, the data we try to use to solve global challenges is data that initially was, um, the purpose of this data was to fulfill regulations or to 
or to gather something else. So we're trying to use data that was never intended to be implemented in AI and try to make AI with it so that there's a there's a mismatch there of um, what data we really should be collecting as opposed to use already ready data from other uh, purposes. Um, so also there was a mention about the improved criminal database management and system. So there is an improvement in how this is efficiently, efficiently done. But of course, there is a huge racial bias um, challenge within the criminal database management. There's been so many examples of how people of color have been assigned to a criminal offense that they never committed. And that has never happened in a white uh, person before with AI. So this is what I mean about how AI, if it's tried to be implemented really fast and quickly, then there's a lot of things on the way that can happen wrong. And we need to really sit down and think, what is the problem? How are we going to face this? And what problems might we find on the way to anticipate to them and make sure that this doesn't happen? Like Microsoft and Google have applied algorithms that have become sexist and that have like excluded women and hiring process and all sorts of other minorities. So it's, it's not about applying it fast and solving a really big problem, but it's about really thinking what relationship we want to have with AI and uh, anticipate to all these things that AI can heritage from us, which are really bad, like bias and discrimination. So, um, so I was gonna make a little point as well about uh, AI for agriculture, which is, I'm doing a project right now with agriculturists from really small farmers and really small landowners and um, these solutions like blockchain and um, drone uh, AI implementation for agriculture, again, is a class issue because it only helps people that own enough land and enough money to implement technology in their land. So when we talk about AI for agriculture, we again have to anticipate how this is not going to be an inclusive system if we don't think about a small farmer or someone that has no relationship with technology. So again, all these, I think these slides are all focused in the potential AI could have, and I'm trying, which I, I agree with everything you said, but I'm trying to bring it down to saying, we need to make sure that we don't look too far ahead and we don't miss out anything that is a threat in between. So yeah, um, AI in agriculture needs to have a small um, checkpoint when we talk about small landowners as these are not included in these blockchain and AI and drone systems that we're talking about, and they're very much excluded from these kind of systems. So next one would be AI in banking. Again, this has to do a lot with digital inclusion, as Albert was talking about. Um, when we're talking about cybersecurity, robo advisors, credit scoring, direct landing, if the data is biased and the data is racist, sexist, um, and all sorts of discriminations, how will we expect this robo advisor to do this properly and to make sure that uh, what values do we want this this cyber AIs to have? Do we want to have equal opportunities? Do we want it to have um, positive discrimination to ensure that you uplift certain people? We need to think about these things before you actually start implementing them, because if you implement them, it's just going to do the same job as it's been done so far, which is really bad, but just expanded and faster. So we're only making the richer people richer, but with the same methods and the same means. So now that we have the power of technology to expand certain voices, let's make sure that that voice expanded is actually and aligned with values first, or else it's just uh, putting Mark Zuckerberg a huge um, microphone and let him speak forever. Um, and I was gonna mention um, as well, sorry, I took notes, so I'm just saying little things uh, all dispersed, but yeah, I was gonna say that this is a, ho I hope this is like, it gives you hope as opposed to is like scary, but um, I believe the true good implementation of AI is to make sure that we anticipate on everything we can think of. Um, the first step of an AI is when you have an idea and on what you want to develop, you need to start thinking what could go wrong. What could, who could it discriminate? Who could it, who could it kill? Who could it harm? Who could it, who could it be benefiting? Who could it be punishing? Do we want it to benefit anyone? All these questions are the key things of it's, it, I always compare AI to raising a child. It's, it's about values at the beginning and then, all the practical things and how it works and how it does this is 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 something else after so um yeah i encourage you to when you're thinking about any AI solution to anticipate to all these maluses first so that would be my comments for the first group and for the second group um ai for security is a topic that's a bit far away from my from my knowledge but uh, i wanted to make a couple of points uh, i think it's uh, ai and bias is very related to this one as well so all the comments i said for group one are very much uh, relatable when you talk about security 
um, if you're just if you're making antiviruses that cost a lot of money and those are really effective, then again, it's a class issue because then it's only people that have money that can protect their information, but people that don't then can't protect themselves. So we need to consider these things as global and accessible and equal when we're designing first. There was a thing mentioned saying that around 40% of the people uh, are offline. I didn't know this fact. Uh, and it said that it would make them vulnerable for targets um, when they do connect. So I, I, I'm not sure, maybe I would like to hear from the group, um, but here I would think that this is unlikely given that when you're constantly online, you create accounts and you do so many transactions online that if there is one leakage in one web you entered once, there's so many more ways to trace it back to yourself than when you're um, digitally inactive. Um, so in fact, I think that people that don't use internet uh, very much are more likely maybe to fall into a scam or to fall into a mail. But uh, from an outsider's point of view, like if a leak happens in a big corporation, you're actually a bigger target the more um, internet you consume. And um, also, I was going to mention that the AI has a huge potential in cybersecurity, but also AI has a huge role in cyber attacks. So this is, um, I always see this, I don't know enough about this topic, so maybe I'm, I'm biased and I'm unknowledgeable, but I always see cybersecurity as two robots fighting each other, like the chess players that um, the AI cybersecurity will be trained to be more secure, but then the cyber attacks will learn from the security and then will attack better. And then this problem is, uh, is a really huge, <laughs> like they will just be competing until forever, until humans don't even understand this intelligence. So I wonder if we should start using platforms that incentivize more transparency and uh, decentralized systems, as opposed to a huge bank having all this information and training these really intelligent algorithms to defend you if we should start using platforms like blockchain that uh, up to now ensure security in most of your transactions, um, or else we'll always have a really smart AI attacker and a really smart AI defender. And um, yeah, I think that's about everything I want to say. I also wanted to add that the same as, I think I was, I've noted this for the answers to the questions, but I'm gonna say it now too. Um, AI security also covers so many physical attributes such as like surveillance and monitoring, which is uh, such a huge topic as well. Um, it could make, um, as I said before, criminal offenses, it could make the process easier, but it could unleash political and government power issues where people have so much information about you, you could be so much easier um, offended. And if we don't rely on our governmental systems yet, how are we giving it a, an AI tool to more effectively um, discriminate us? Um, so for example, in China, they use facial recognition for so many state related activities. They use this app called Face++, which uh, manages everything from when you get onto the train and if you go to a shop. So there, this is a controversy, so how, it's, it's, it's an ethical problematic because who is the owner of this data? Who, who, how, are, how are we gonna make this process rightful and ensure that the person who is uh, entitled to this data, let's say government, is gonna uh, manage this uh, information about us correctly? Do we trust them? Um, yeah, that's about everything I've got to say. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ms. Anna Hernandez, for that um, wonderful comment and presentation. Um, we learned a lot from it, and thank you very much for mentoring us today. Thank you once again, Mr. Abad Skoué. So um, now we've come to this uh, picture section. So I advise everybody to put on your videos. We are going to take some pictures. These pictures will be uploaded on our social media platforms. I will write on tag our mentors. We tag Gypsy mentorship and pages, and we we'll write a thing or two that we've learned from our mentors today. So while we are taking the pictures, um, I will remind the group one and group two members to work on your week eight project and be prepared to submit it by the week, eighth week of the program. So you, it's just a reminder for all of us. Thank you very much as you put up your videos. I'm taking the screenshots now. Thank you very much.
Okay, that's it. I can see your beautiful faces, your handsome faces. Um, so now we'll be moving on to the question and answer session for today. And we'll be asking the mentees, if they have any questions, you can raise your hand and I'll call you to ask the mentors any life question before we move to the questions you sent earlier for the mentors. So if you have any direct question you want to ask either of the mentors, you can raise your hand and I'll call you on. So um, in absence of the, um, any questions, so we will be reading the first question. Oladotun's hand is up. Okay, I can't see her hand, so you can ask your question. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Miss Anna and Mr. Albert. Well, my question is, I'm not quite sure if it's Miss Anna that mentioned it. She said that there are other areas to security aside cyber security. I don't know if you can identify some of these areas so that we can look into it and gain more knowledge. Then um, my second question, I think is to Mr. Albert, how can we follow the narrative, just like a brief summary of how can we follow the narrative of artificial intelligence in relation to, um, cyber, in relation to security generally in Nigeria? Because you work in Nigeria, you work for the government in Nigeria, so somehow, somehow it brings the topic home. So how can we learn and follow the, the narrative or the story in Nigeria in relation to artificial intelligence and security? Thank you very much. Okay, and um, I was mentioning when I said cybersecurity, I think the name of the topic was security with AI and then, um, what I was saying is the slides were quite focused on cybersecurity and I wanted to add um, surveillance and monitoring, which is what I explained about how facial recognition is sometimes used um, for criminal offenses, for entry, for controlling people. Even in China, you, they know how much toilet paper you use a day um, thanks to all these uh, surveillance methods. So I meant more that other than just the safety in the digital world, how they can use digital technologies to control you in the outside world. Okay, I think Mr. Yes, so, um, okay, I, I remember also mentioning issues around like bomb detection and um, um, home security and assistance systems and things like that. So there's a physical dimension to AI insecurity. I think that's what um, Anna was trying to point out um, in, in, in clear, clear, clear terms, right? Um, so for my own question from um, you about um, how do you follow the narrative? So one thing you need to remember is that information is always power. Um, it's oversaid, it seems like a cliche, but it's just the truth. Information is power. And those who know end up becoming those who um, within a power interest dynamic become the high powered, high interest people. Okay, and so I think my own advice, because I'm based in Nigeria, I've worked in Nigeria for, for, for a very long time, uh, my own advice to you would be, first of all, to stay connected to the sources of correct, up-to-date information, okay? So it's one thing, some people get so drawn to the information from certain channels and discount information from some other channels. So that's another thing I have an issue with with regards to, um, platforms like Meta and um, Google and the rest that do these um, predictive reviews and then uh, push information to you based on your um, previous patterns. So assume that you're on YouTube and you watch a video about A, automatically YouTube just analyzes and brings out a recommendation for video B that follows from video A. The risk of that is that you end up getting pigeonholed into a specific perspective and you then don't have as much recommendations of things beyond that perspective or outside on the opposite side, 
right? So I think it's good to know and be connected to information from all avenues. So I'm talking from governments, from non-governmental um, organizations, from um, individuals, from um, um, corporates, private sector actors, connect to information from all of the sources. And one way I stay relevant with regards to information is through communities, okay? So it's one thing for you to be an individual and try to operate in a society, but a community gives you an added advantage. So I'll give examples of the communities. For instance, um, the United Nations Internet Governance Forum made a call for young people from around the world to join a youth policymaker um, cohort that would be involved in drafting youth-based um, or youth advantageous policies with regards to internet governance on a global scale. And all it meant was me seeing this um, call online. And then I put in an application and submitted and I got selected to join that policymaker group. Okay, so information, like I said, is power. The information then gets you access to communities. And then within that community now, I have a network of people from over 50 countries that are driving um, innovative change from either public sector, private sector, um, CSO, or nonprofit perspectives around internet governance around the world. So I, I then have more information because I belong to that community. I then have access to opportunities. I then have the knowledge and the skill sets over time to become more effective as a, as, a, as, a, as a person. So I think my advice to you is get yourself connected to where the information flows from, credible, up-to-date and useful information, but don't be too focused on one sector or one aspect. Connect to the people building the AI innovation from startup hubs to innovation and tech hubs. There's communities all over the world that belong to those kinds of subsectors, right? So connect to those places. What are they doing? Visit those hubs, talk to the founders, know their challenges, know what they are building, what are they trying to solve? When you get that perspective, you also connect to public sector. What is the government doing? What policies are in place? So for instance, Nigeria is, is, has been pushing and flagging off the Nigerian Startup Bill. And the reason for the Nigerian Startup Bill started because there was a particular need for um, tech-based innovators to aggregate together and push the government to make policies that benefit um, startups that are, no, that are tech-based and so cannot access opportunities in conventional methods. So for instance, nobody would give, no bank would give a loan to a startup that is working around risky digital or AI-based solutions, right? And so there was need for alternative financing methods. There was need for um, um, technical support, a whole lot of other things. And so these things happening in your society are things that other people know about, so you can learn about them from others, are things that are available online, so you can learn them from the internet, are things that when you connect to a community, you get the first-hand information and knowledge. So my advice, get information, get connected to communities, and then keep growing that network over time. I think you're going to be um, okay. So some people have those networks through their paid employment. So for instance, if you work with a company that allows you to engage on a daily basis with people that are pioneering artificial intelligence solutions, then it means you're connected already, right? But for those outside of the system who are looking to get in, you then need the people, the other um, organizations, the communities to help you push to a place of knowledge and information. So I think that's my advice for you as one Nigerian to another. I want to talk you to you through Albert's Thank comment you. as well. Um, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I was going to say, I, my design is in background. My background is in design and AI. So I use this combination to when I design AI, and I think it's really useful the same way as Albert was saying, you need to understand the people you're designing for. And to do this, even though you think you do, you need to really ask them the right questions and really understand what they're trying to say. So the method I tend to use is design methodologies to understand the issue as if I was going to design a product, whereas at the end, the product would be an AI. So um, there's also a huge link between design processes and uh, interview systems uh, as a first process in AI. So I truly recommend to use um, human-centered systems design thinking which is a method which is exactly what Albert was saying, but as opposed to trying to understand how to tackle this, there are written methodologies that help you step-by-step uh, step on how to, what's your first step? Um, how do you, which communities do you go to? Do you need to go to the places that are very stuck together or very spread out to make sure that you have different views? So th there's guidance online about this topic. Um, I'll, I'll put it on the chat. 
um, on how to make sure that you're doing your research process in a ethical and inclusive way and thinking about the people you're designing for. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Anna Hernandez for the contribution and Mr. Abad Kure for answering the question. So I'll be reading out the questions that were sent by the mentors. So the first question is for Mr. Albert, and after Mr. Albert answers the question, Ms. Hernandez can also contribute. So large companies like Apple and Google have invested in developing artificial intelligence beyond those businesses. AI is frequently underused in other sectors, including banking, agriculture, education, and healthcare. All, this, all these sectors produce enormous volumes of data every single day, but AI is really used to analyze massive data sets and draw, draw conclusions for the patterns and features of the data, of that data. We have read about the top problems with AI like data leakage and infringement of data privacy and security. What can bridge the gap between, I think this is the question, so what can bridge the gap between those AI problems and the profitability of a business. Okay, um, so thank you very much for that question. I found that question quite interesting from a perspective because from the beginning, the person was talking about the fact that um, um, AI is frequently underused. And then your presentations obviously showed us that AI is being used in so many of the sectors, right? So I would first start by saying I'm not very I don't completely agree that AI is frequently underused in certain sectors because there's two, there's two angles to AI use, right? So there's subtle AI usage, which is when you integrate AI within processes in a way that you don't physically um, observe what AI does in that process, okay? So, so sometimes AI exists within processes and systems and we just don't take note of it and we assume it isn't there, so we assume it's underused. Another approach is to take now the non-subtle AI use, which is kind of like physical things you can see, for instance, an automated system, right? You know that because it's taking process A through process Z on its own, you then can easily think that something is driving that. And so you know that there's an AI involved, right? But I think in most sectors right now in the world, there's AI components littered all across um, 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 multiple sectors. And from group one's presentation, they touched on so many of these sectors, so I wouldn't go too much into things. So I was I'm, I'm talking to someone and I said, imagine using Grammarly, right? So you're typing something and then Grammarly helps you edit. That's AI trying to help you with <laughs> your, your writing. So literally we use AI every day sometimes. We don't even take note of it or we wait till we see this really big, um, um, use of AI before we assume that, okay, there's AI here, but very simple tasks, chatbots to um, your Siri for your phone to so many things are all based on AI. So I think don't um, say that AI is frequently underused. That's the first thing I would want to um, argue against. Um, and so then there's a subtle um, AI usage you need to be careful to note for, and then also the not so subtle use. Um, so, but for the issue, the question, the main question around um, let me just see it. Um, so you've read about the problems around um, data leakage, infringement of data privacy and security, what can bridge the gap? I think from my perspective, I'll say the gap can be bridged from multiple um, angles. So one angle is um, through, through innovation, okay? And by through innovation, I mean how the AI platforms are built, what goes into building them, what goes into designing them, what they are built for, um, and all of that innovative processes can help you towards ensuring that the AI platform you eventually end up with um, is, 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 is going to be something that would be profitable for whoever uses it, whether a person, an organization, a government, it doesn't matter, right? So innovation is one angle I would say to it. And um, there's something um, I wanted to point out a while ago when Anna was talking, um, when she was using the, the child um, analogy saying um, what you train the child on is what the child grows up to do. I also have this belief that for, for things that are tools, it's usually around the integrity, the values of the person who uses those tools. So for instance, I believe for AI, it's around what's the value system of the person who designed this tool or who is trying to use this artificial intelligence platform, right? Because then when you begin to take considerations from those perspectives as well, it then helps bridge that gap between um, the problem 
um, as well as the profitability for using of, of AI. Um, with regards to issues around data leakage and infringement on data privacy and security, I would want to use an analogy of um, um, Anna had said about um, a face off between both the hackers AI and then also the protective AI, right? So I want to use an analogy about protecting the protector, right? So this AI platform may be needed to, to secure or to protect a system, but then you also need to consider how secure and safe that protector in itself is. So I, I think it just creates a chain that you then protect the protector who is doing a job of protecting something. But then when someone comes along who is able to crack the protection, you then need to circle back and have your AI, um, or, or rather if your AI is, 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 is incorporated with algorithm that allows it to um, iterate over time, it then comes up with new algorithms or new methodologies to tackle down the, um, the data breach or the leak that has already happened. So it's, it's an iterative process is, is circular in, in the fact that the more you protect something, the more effort people put in to try to break that security or, or, or breach that privacy. And then the more you also put in to try to protect it in, in itself again. So I think it then becomes this unending cycle that we have. Um, another thing also aside to innovation is um, the policy and regulation, right? Policy and regulation can help um, bridge the gap between um, the problems that AI face, as well as the problems that AI is trying to tackle and the profitability of using all of these AI solutions. Because um, I gave an example earlier, I was talking about um, um, a Meta, right? Facebook, imagine Meta owns Facebook, um, WhatsApp and, and, and your Instagram. So basically it means every single day of your life, you are feeding data to one single entity. That, that's what it, it means in summary, right? And because of that, it then means that you need policy and regulation that is sufficient to protect the citizens and the people who use all of these platforms. So I think policy is, is, is both a protection, but also an enabling, and an enabling factor. Because on one hand, it protects the users, but on the other hand, it gives the producers and the creators of all of these artificial intelligence-based platforms the space to thrive in that they are business owners, they are trying to make profits, they're trying to get, gather data, data that may be used for any number of reasons. Like I said, the tool is not at fault, it's how it's used. I remember a line from a movie where um, um, DMX once said, guns don't kill people, people kill people. Um, um, I, it stuck with me when I heard that years and years ago, because in reality, it's the person controlling the tool that has the, um, that, that bears the onus of um, either, standing to justify how they've used the tool or trying to keep themselves in check not to misuse the tool okay so innovation policy regulation process management is also something that can help um, um, and then those are just a few things i i would say around the answer to that question so first of all i don't completely agree that ai is is um not frequently used it's very, very frequently used, trust me. You just may not realize it over time. So for instance, assume a person goes to a bank and you apply for a loan, right? Most banks nowadays do not run um, credit determination or decisions on who to grant loans to by human decisions because there's error in that, there's bias that comes in and so many other factors to, to consider. So most times your life on a daily basis is one way or another affected by the actions of someone who uses AI or um, the decisions of an AI-based platform in one way or the other. So I think that's my answer to the question. Thank you very much. So Mr. Nandes can contribute. Amazing. Um, I'll start by saying that um, I think I agree with the statement that it's underused if we're talking about in reference to when AI is used for other things like it's AI is a lot less used for social good and socioeconomic challenges than it is to monitor your Instagram or I don't know Amazon has AI to monitor that you are not stopped for more than five seconds to make sure that you are moving and being productive so for sure if you if you it's it's there's a lot of advancements in AI for good but when you compare it to the people that you, are normally using AI, they're focused on other things that don't really have much to do with this. Um, so in that sense, I agree that it's um, underused and also the little examples of AI for good um, have, there's been a lot of ethical scandals. So apart from it being underused compared to other things, it's also misused. And um, most of the 
AI trials for big companies that they put out in the market without really testing it for everyone um, have been proven to fail to most of us other than those privileged ones. So um, yeah, uh, in the sense of that uh, polemic of it, it's been underused or overused. I think there's still a huge space of exploration and to make sure we get it right. Um, with regards to data leakage, uh, I think um, there is a, we're always, I think this is a really good dynamic because Albert is very focused on the policy and I'm, I'm in, in the design bits. So I feel like there's so many things you can do along the way to make sure that in its release time, it's not bad. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of places you can start in between. At the beginning, the, the first very step, I'd like to say when you collect data, there's a lot of data that you collect that is very irrelevant. And then there's leakage that this data is leaked and there was no real purpose for that data to be there in the first place. So that is a, uh, we can start by erasing this uh, unneeded data leakage. For example, uh, this is also an ethical philosophy thing. <laughs> AI is full of these uh, things that you don't know if you agree with or not, but um, I used to think that um, telling my bank my gender was not uh, beneficial for me because why would they want to know? So um, uh, how the world is right now, I think there's a lot of these things you have to fill in uh, about where you're born, what your color of your skin is, what your ethnicity is, your gender, if you're able-bodied or not, which um, currently I think is punishing us because what they don't really use that data for anything other than for algorithms to decide if they want to give us money or not. So currently it's not really helping us. But in the future, I feel like we should, uh, in, in a very far future, I feel like this should be used to positive ponderate. So if you're trying to give a, a scholarship to someone, you should try and try to make it not equal, but, but not... Um, the same, but equality, which means uh, favoring those who need it the most. Um, so this is not where we are in the world right now, sadly, but in the world, this should be used for those kind of purposes. Currently, there's a lot of uh, questions being asked just to feed the algorithms of your postcode, um, how old you are and all these things that currently are just uh, a stopper in our way. So first of all, I like to say in data leakage, to be efficient in what data we want from people. So if you, uh, for example, work in a big company, and uh, this company, you're in charge of making the data or creating the data formatting to make sure that you don't use or collect any data from people that doesn't really ha have any um, positive impact. So it can only be used against them more so than for them. So first, on what data we collect, and then uh, that can reduce the leakage in the first place. And then when you have the data, there's uh, things we can be inspired by, for example, banks, um, they encode everything. So they, for example, a name of someone or their address is encoded in a way where they change the letters and the surnames and the spaces in a way where no human person can read it. But there's this like private backlog that links a person to a code or something like this. This can also be hacked, but we can be inspired by making sure that our data um, most hacking data is very encoded, but make sure that our every day-to-day -day data uh, that we tend to think won't be hacked, uh, try and do it this way. So encode personal addresses, names, and all these vulnerable data. And uh, between the bridge between um, AI and business, I feel like there's a huge uh, threat, for example, when we trust AI too much to think that it will make us more efficient. There are so many healthcare examples, for example, that the AI can detect a cancer. And there's this case where an AI robot detected a cancer on a patient and the human doctors that were around it couldn't see the cancer anywhere. They, they tried and tried, but they couldn't detect it. But the AI was saying that this person had cancer. So they treated this person for cancer, even though no human ever diagnosed this person with cancer. So I feel like this is obviously a huge bridge. It can anticipate us to things and this person was eventually better. Um, but also, again, as I, I, I make a lot of important key points on how, what is the point in using AI for medical care? We need to be really careful with our, our goal and our method in this process. Who is the money for and who are we trying to um, better? Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Hernandez. Um, I'll be taking the next question now for Ms. Hernandez again, and Mr. Akure can contribute after she answers the question. So um, is AI smarter than humans? That's the second question. 
Is artificial intelligence smarter than human beings? Uh, I'll start with this question uh, and I'll say that I think this is a really tricky question that people tend to ask uh, quite a lot and I don't think there is a right answer or a wrong answer. I think it's very much uh, the way you see AI. But uh, as I said before, I think AI is a tool and it's better in us in certain things and worse in us in other certain things. Uh, but we are in fact uh, the parents of AI. So we get to decide uh, when AI is used and when it can beat us. Like it can beat us like a calculator beats us to make a mathematical equation, but we shouldn't make, we shouldn't give power to AI when we think we are better than this, when we can put critical thought or emotions in front of a calculator. So um, uh, it's not about if AI is smarter or if are we smarter with AI. Um, but yeah, in, in history, we've had so many tools similar to AI, that, like a calculator, like a computer, like a wheel, that this was never a threat to humanity. We were never threatened by these things. But now there is this fetish, this constant trial of making uh, robots look like humans, which actually leads nowhere. And there is no point in making a robot look and talk like a human. There's, there's just this want that humanity has to see a robot looking like a human, but there is actually no goal. There is no benefit to anyone. It's just this very shallow industry that doesn't really uh, fill a purpose. So like if you think of Alexa or Siri, they're just trying to be similar to us all the time, but what really is the point in that? Um, should we make AI do other things that we can't do as opposed to talk like us and feel like us and um, be our secretary and be sexy? Is that the point? And then, um, yeah, I don't think AI should be a human replacement or a superhuman, uh, but just a tool by our side that help us uh, improve. So I think AI is faster at calculations and sometimes has a bigger picture than us because it can process so much information at once, whereas we can't. Um, but it could never be, uh, it could ne we have so many abilities that we don't have. Uh, we as humans are faulty. We can love things, enjoy things that they can't do. I don't think this is a league and um, we just need to establish our relationship with AI and when are humans better with AI and when are we not? And this is when we close AI and we do not use AI and we believe in humans. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Bart can contribute. Okay, so so I, I completely agree with um, Anna's perspective. I think we focus too much on the wrong thing. Um, so the conversation shouldn't be AI versus human beings. The conversation should be how better can we be with AI? Right, um, so, so that's the, that's the conversation we should be having because if you if you begin to want to argue who is smarter and who isn't, it, it we waste so much time that we can use for something much more productive, right? So um, I used to give this analogy. So uh, if I give you my mobile phone um, and I ask you to decode the passcode on the phone, right, and I give that same phone to probably a robot that is empowered with um, some AI um, technology or something, right? The, the the robot will take an approach that is, it is meant to take as a robot, right? It may begin to run um, searches or run um, consecutive um, number systems to try to find which code is the correct code, which is an okay approach to take. But you may begin to look at me and ask, okay, when was Albert born? What's his birthday? What's his, um, what's his favorite restaurant? What's his favorite food? At the end of the day, both of you, both the human and the, the robot may end up unlocking the phone. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter who, who unlocks the who doesn't. What we usually want to focus on is who did it faster, right? So in situations where AI helps us make things faster, that could be an advantage. We capitalize on that advantage and take that win. But we shouldn't then begin to compare how or the process in which the passcode was decoded and focus on that. Because the essence of the exercise was unlock the phone, okay? Not a matter of how you unlock the phone. So for the human being taking a very human perspective or approach, he or she takes that approach because they are human. For the robot or the AI-based um, um, platform taking its own approach, it's taking the approach because it's AI powered. So it's not a matter of comparison because we really shouldn't be compared um, um, in my own opinion as well. So I do agree with Anna on all of those points, that the fact that AI is better than us in some things, it can analyze data, it can gather data, it can um, make predictive decisions based off of that data much faster than we can. But at the same time, it's not um, open to divergent thinking. It's not 
um, open to as much creativity or inspiration as human beings would be. So why would you then begin to compare on equal things um, in an equality um, 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 dynamic, right? So my own approach also is that um, we shouldn't gauge because if you check the word smarter or the word intelligent, um, they could mean different things at different times. So for what some people will say being smart is um, having or showing quick-witted intelligence. So if quick quickness comes into conversation, it's about speed, right? So AI would obviously win when it comes to speed. But then if you impute faulty data, um, it doesn't matter how fast AI is, it will make the wrong conclusion. So, so, so it's a trade-off um, from one thing to another, and we should find ways to complement one another rather than um, constantly compete to see which is better, which is worse off. I think that's just my own perspective as well to your, your question. Okay, thank you very much, sir, for answering that question. And Ms. Hernandez also, now we, we know how to better ask, we know what to focus on that um, we are not supposed to be comparing AI to humans. Instead, we should be focusing on the areas where AI can help human better our lives. So the final question for today before we end the session is so, so, okay, I think Ms. Hernandez can go first in answering the question and Mr. Albert can also chip in. So how can AI, which causes security threats, be used to tackle security challenges? Yeah, I think I, I said most of the things I had to say for this question uh, a bit earlier, but um, just retaking where I left it before, uh, there is so much we can get inspired by the banking sector, which is obviously not um, total inspiration, but for what there is out there right now, the banking sector has a, a relatively efficient way to make sure that data makes sense for AI, but not for humans. So. Um, if we encode our data and it's leaked, this data is always irrelevant and it can't be used for mal purposes, um, as no one can really understand it. It's used for analyzing and for predicting trends and things, but it's never it can never be really used against you as it doesn't really say anything under a human eye. So I think um, that's a way that AI could uh, protect us, make a layer that's uh, invisible to the eye. Although then who the owner of this AI then has a lot of power, but this, this will always, ha always happen with AI. Um, as I said, the, this, the, the, I am a bit of knowledge about AI security, but I always find that uh, for as long as we keep living in the system where we have AI attackers and AI defenders, they will both become smarter at the same rate. Um, so I struggle to think of a brighter future when it comes to AI security if we keep using the same systems we use now, whereas um, AI security within people that own a lot of data, and it's like a skewed world where so many people, so many few people have the data of everybody else in the world. So for as long as that is still the same, I have not much hope for the sector in AI. <laughs> But um, I think there is upcoming trends like blockchain and transparency and decentralized systems that give me a bit more hope on seeing the world in a more uh, less hack uh, and transparent and less hierarchical in terms of power and data. So I would say um, instead of using AI, I would try to focus on AI on other emerging technologies as opposed to the classic banking data sets and try to protect them very strongly, use uh, systems that are designed to be uh, never hacked. Thank you very much. Okay, Ms. Hernandez and Mr. Albert can also contribute before we end the session. I think you are muted, Mr. Albert. Me? Sorry, what did you say? Oh, okay. Go on then. Okay, um, can you guys hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay, okay. Apologies, um, I'm having a bit of a glitch on my device. Um, so so I, I don't have so much to say on this point because I, like I said earlier, it becomes an issue of protecting the protector. Um, so so, so um, that's the reality we then find ourselves in. Uh, but also then it's something to note is that um, um, AI, so AI susceptibility, right? To, um, um, to seek other insecurity threats, is something that would always be reality. It's not going to change, it's not going to. Um, and so in as much as we're having a lot of um, white hats protecting um, 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 and securing 
the world, we also still keep having a lot more black hats coming up to find ways to um, 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 break all of the encryptions or the algorithms or all of the AI tools that have been built to protect, protect data. So I do agree that encryption can be a, a way, but I think for me, it just becomes an unending battle of protecting the protector on a, in a circular motion until the point we get to where none of us exists to even bother about what data is safe and what data is not safe, to be honest, because um, the way the world works, we are a data-driven world um, and data is so important to us because there's a lot of things that can be done with data, both good and bad. Um, so I think because of that, there's going to constantly be the threat of um, insecurity for, um, for data for um, and then also the, the threats to artificial intelligence systems and also its use in also threatening in other systems. So it's, it's just a reality we have to find a way of coming to terms with. Um, and then we just have to keep trying to, I'm not so much of a, um, AI developer myself, but I think it just becomes a protect the protector scenario over and over again, or in the worst case situation, we have the regulators and the policy maker, makers come up with ways to ensure some form of um, coverage or security with regards to either criminalizing some use of, um, um, or some approaches to AI usage, or coming up with some way to um, prevent people from taking certain approaches to compromising the security of data or platforms that are supposed to be protected. So I think it's it's an unending un conversation and we need to keep having these conversations until a better way comes up that we can safely and securely say we have ensured security for uh, platforms and data that we have. But I think that is not something very realistic at this point, to be honest. Thank you very much once again, Mr. Abad and Ms. Hernandez for choosing to mentor us today. Um, I think we've learned one or two things from our mentorship session today and um, we thank you once again. And thank also the, ment uh, the mentees that came up together, the groups uh, that did the presentation and come up with the PowerPoints. Thank you very much once again for joining us today. And I'll be handing over to Ms. Juliana for the closing remarks before we end the meeting. Thank you very much, Albert, for today. Thank you for coming and thank you for sharing with us. It's always good to have you in our sessions. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, thank you for volunteering. Thank you for coming. And thank you also for sharing. You um, really brought a lot of um, very insightful perspective to the discussion today. And I think that the combination of Albert and Anna really worked today. Thank you so much. Um, so I really want to say a very big thank you to the mentees. Thank you for researching and thank you also for presenting beautifully. Please continue working together and cooperating with one another. Please let's not fail to post what we learned on LinkedIn and tag Mr. Albert and um, Anna also, they would, love to hear what you learned so please feel free to take a screenshot and write what you learned and don't forget that in the eighth week you'll be submitting your week um, your um your assignments for week eight so please start working on it and make sure you come up with something beautiful for week eight with that we've come to the end of the session today thank you so much hussein for for administering the session today for moderating the session and with that we've come to the end thank you so much everyone have a lovely rest or work time depending on where you are thank you all bye thank, thank you everyone, everyone. Bye. bye bye bye